morning. My name is Jisoo Kim. I'm the director of the DW Institute for Korean Studies. I'm also the Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Languages and Literatures. We are opening the spring semester at GWIS here with Professor Lee's talk. Um, and this is the third pre-modern Korea lecture series of this academic year. Well, thanks to our audience joining us very early in the morning here in DC, but late in the evening in Korea. Um, and also, I don't know, it could be afternoon or, just, or it's wherever you are in the different time zones. Uh, I'm delighted to have Professor Lee with us today. She is one of the few lit scholars publishing pre-modern Korean literature in English. And I'm so glad we have an opportunity to learn from her research today. Um, before I uh, introduce uh, Professor Lee, I would like to mention that for our audience, uh, you can use Q&A box to submit your questions. You can type them or uh, we'll also have a um, rate, which we, we'll also uh, use raise hand function. Uh, you can use raise hand function to ask questions directly to Janet, uh, to Professor Lee. So um, there are two options you can ask your questions. Uh, type your questions in the QA box, or uh, you can uh, click raise hand function and then ask. Uh, your question directly to Professor Lee. All right, without further ado, I'll ask, uh, I'll, uh, I'll introduce um, Professor Lee. Janet Lee is an associate professor in the Department of Korean Language and Literature at Kenyon University in South Korea. She received a PhD from UCLA. Her research focuses on the topics of gender and medical science in pre-modern and early modern Korean texts. She has numerous publications. Some major publications include a book chapter, a recently published chapter, Love, Sickness, and Death in 17th Century Korean Literature in the Routledge Companion to Korean Literature. And uh, some of her research articles include the intertextual aspect of women's culinary manuscripts in Chosen Korea, Tale of Chunyang is translated by Western missionaries, The Matrix of Gender, Knowledge, and Writing in the Kyuak Chongso, Dilemma of the Love Sick Hero, Masculine Images and Politics of the Body in 17th Century Korean Love Tales and Female Desire, Illness, Metamorphosis in Love Sick Snake Narratives in 15th Century Korea. All right, without further ado, I'll uh, pass it over to Janet. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this GW lecture series of Korean Modern Korea. And I, I'm also really grateful to Chichisu for organizing this great event. And um, for today's lecture, I would like to share uh, my research about this Korean romance uh, during the chosen period. And a while ago, I was uh, dissertating about the motive of love sickness in Korean as Sang Sak Byung. It's kind of frequented in love stories. And honestly speaking, um, this is kind of unfinished projects, but I still find it interesting as the stories contain many diverse aspects of chosen culture, including the courtship, love, and sickness as well. So I hope this lecture offers some good knowledge about the pre-modern Korean culture and also provokes some deep thinking on the understanding of the body and sexuality as well. Um, and I, uh, let me just share my screen with you and here we go. So before we uh, do a more serious discussion about it, uh, I just want to give uh, just a sample of the story. It's a Chigui's story, Chigui's Hora. So for example, uh, I actually cited this Chigui story um, in my abstract of this talk. And the story as entitled, uh, The Heart Fire, fire uh, The Coiling Around the Pagoda, and in the tale, Chigi uh, is a petty officer from the commoner class, falls in love with Queen Sundok, Sundok Yawang, at first sight. And the queen hears of the Chigi earnest fervor for her. She summons him to uh, the monastery. So Chigi waits for her at the foot of pagoda, but unfortunately, he falls asleep. So when he learns that the queen left while he was slapped, his anger turns him into burning fire. And this man in a passionate love turns himself into fire demon, and which was uh, suggested to be uh, the consequence of his uncontrollable feelings of self-pity, anger, and grief. 
Um, so the story actually implies that emotional disturbance can result in visible and physical transformations. Uh, so in Chigi's story, his display of a passion and sincerity eventually to gain some of the sympathy from the queen who actually gives him then the bracelet and composes a poem to console this annoyed spirit of the new fire demon. But the Chigi story also raises some question like um, how we define love. Is it emotional, physical, or something else? Or how can this passionate love make you sick or lead you to death? Or how does love represent in the other stories? And how does the love sickness connect emotion and the body? So the interpretation of the character's passion and consequential like um, metamorphosis or death tends to yield uh, different and even competing understandings of emotion in the body. So today I will focus on the two representative stories from the Joseon period, uh, which are the Sangsa Donggi, the tale of Sangsa Dong and Unyong Jung, tale of Unyong, and discuss a literary representation of love sickness in the tale to show uh, how the love scenes can be envisioned as a nexus of negotiations among passion or the body and, and culture norms. So before uh, we explore the, the more of the, those stories, I would like to contour the literary context where the stories are situated in. And largely the stories can be categorized as romance. And, but this romance was not a highly welcomed genre in the, uh, the during the uh, chosen period because there's kind of um, ideas about what is good literature and the orthodox literature. And also many people kind of concerned about or they have some awareness about the state's censorship always play, play out. So in case you're uh, producing a story or it's not like something more formal or classical or ideological, uh, or you wanted to explore a more fictional thing or the love or romance in, or of a dream or fantasy and so on, it was not like a desirable genre for the literati or male elites. But after this invention of hunger, uh, we see the widened readership and much more materials was written in vernacular Korean. And also during about this time now, we see more stories about the romance or fiction or fiction genres uh, written in a leery Chinese and particularly inspired by the Tang Chanchi. So uh, the Chanchi is a tale of wonder. And this uh, under this kind of um, the influence of uh, the Chinese literary tradition and the Korean literati, they also create their own genre of this kind of romance. And we have to go back to this question, what do we mean by romance then? Actual romance uh, emphasized falling in love and established committed relationship between characters. And it also describes a hero or a heroine and together at whose development of the romantic relationship leads to the main conflict of the story. And usually it has a happy ending where the character's wish or desire is fulfilled and usually good are rewarded and the evil are punished. So for example, uh, the kind of earlier kind of fictional, the, uh, the prose uh, in this e, uh, Kim shi collections, uh, Yi Seng Kyu Zhang Zhen or Yi Seng Kyu Zhang Zhen, the scholar appears over the wall. And when you look at this story, it actually takes a form of Tang Chuan Chi, but it's, it's not all about this kind of um, like a random story. It's a from uh, developed one from some more biographical sketches of one man. And uh, in terms of this kind of look into story, you probably see more kind of mixture of prose and poetry. So poetry is a more in a form of sometimes a dialogue, but and also in prose and poetry, the ratio is quite 50-50. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, the poetry materials in the text. And we can also see the rich classical references and allusions. And, but the, what the story is about is falling in love with a female. And in this real life, uh, they were a scholar and they were uh, a beautiful woman and they just met, uh, <clears throat> uh, find each other in love. And, but the story is not, does not actually end there. There's more kind of um, supernatural uh, confidence because uh, this woman, it eventually, she kind of uh, died during the invasion and she kind of reborn as a ghost 
And this uh, scholar Kim uh, is remat this lady Trey, uh, who is now is in a, in a form of ghost. Uh, so they actually have this reunion, but this reunion is not like something in the real life. So uh, they kind of describe law beyond time and space. So going back to this question. So there are some similarity to structure and elements of romance or the romantic fiction, but the story does not actually do not fit, uh, fit the general perception of literary genres, uh, like what is, uh, is romance or prose or a novel or a fiction and so on. So actually, uh, when you look at this kind of uh, stories in the, the chosen period, uh, we probably have more questions. What is the major conflicts of the stories and how are the theme of separation or suffering or sickness uh, being emphasized in the text. And actually this type of story actually emerged uh, from the early Chosen period of about the 15th century. And we see more and more stories in literary Chinese uh, in the 17th century after the Japanese invasions. And starting from the kimchi, it's like a kumoshina. There are some six stories collected in this, this one. And we see the Chesu, uh, Seolgung Chanjeon, and Qingguangane Kijegi. And uh, and around this time, uh, Gompil actually left two works after uh, uh, this, uh, the Chu Seng John and Wee Kyung Chun John. And uh, the, actually, the thing uh, that we want to actually focus more on today is uh, these two stories, Un Yong John and the Sangsa Donggi. Uh, both are from anonymous writer, uh, but many presumably the stories emerge around this time. And also another uh, very important talk text of uh, the love stories and so on would be uh, the Tre Chok Jan and, and another kind of famous story would be the Nine Cloud Dream, Ku Mong. So I want to look into uh, the story now. <clears throat> the first story I want to talk about is a tale of Chang Sa Dong. So you probably notice, oh, something happened in this uh, neighborhood, right? Chang Sa Dong. And uh, actually, I tried to just locate where the Sang Sa Dong is when I just visit the Seoul. Uh, and whenever I, it's more like a kind of traveler. <laughs> I feel like a traveler is wandering around the streets. And many Asian scholars, they point out, maybe Sang Sa Dong is around this, uh, now it is Chong Jin Dong here. But uh, another, uh, the references, uh, they kind of indicate that, oh, Sang Sa Dong is a kind of Eastern to this uh, Chong Myo, the ancestor rites over here. So probably Chang Sa Dong located about here or the here and very close to this Chang Ge Chan uh, in here. So uh, it's always kind of helpful when you imagine like uh, the space, right? Uh, when uh, all, all the stories actually set in uh, some temporal uh, points and all the spatial points too. So uh, I hope this is kind of uh, is intriguing to you as well. So back to story. So in the tale of Sang Sa Dong, the male character, scholar Kim, uh, is a very charming and talented young man, but he's not very successful hero from the beginning. Actually, he is so good at literary, uh, literary Chinese and in how excels in the scholarship. So he actually passes the first examination at a young age. And many families hope to arrange a marriage with him and one of their daughters. And his success in marriage seemed unsure. Uh, in short, uh, but one day he sees a beautiful woman uh, around 16 years old and on the street of Sang Sa Dong and thrilled Kim actually follows her footstep but could not actually duress her. And since he saw her, he becomes trapped in an unhealthy kind of emotional cycle alternating between happiness and despair and fear and hope and his health deteriorates uh, as he cannot actually sleep or uh, eat. Uh, this is a quote from the text here. So. This actually describes the symptoms, what he's kind of experiencing here. But rather, the, these stories that like direct attention to the hero's debilitation and weakness. And uh, the, the, his hero actually deviates from this hegemonic image of man who actually achieves the sexual conquest and social victory, uh, like in the Kung Mong, the Nine Cloud Dream. And the Sang Sa Dong actually suggests male characters' vulnerability in descriptions of physical symptoms of love sickness and emergence of love sick heroes susceptible to emotional agitation and company the physical symptoms are complicates the understanding of the Korean masculine ideals such as kunja as kind of confusion like a gentlemanship 
and or Sanye Tejangbu, it's kind of macho man or manly man. So the sight of Yong Yong actually corrupts scholar Kim's judgment, and he thinks of her night and day. And his servant, actually Mak Dong, actually noticed Kim's emotional distress and physical deterioration, so takes a pity on his situation. So Mak Dong actually uh, gathers information from the street and finds out that Yong Yong is a palace woman of the, the Prince Kwesan. And Magda arranged an, an opportunity for the scholar Kim to meet her at her aunt's home. And Kim, like, pursuantly tries to seduce Yong Yong, but she kind of refuses it. And afterward, he falls critically ill, but his symptom of love sickness actually bring him an opportunity to meet her at the palace. And Yong Yong, touched by his uh, the passion, takes advantage of the prince's absence and invites him to the palace. And passing through this kind of cave in like an area of the wall, he actually finds, uh, finally spends a night with her in the palace. And after that night, Yong Yong actually writes to him a poem about the sorrow uh, of parting. So in this poem, she determines to actually separate herself from him and wishing only that he will pass the examination and meet an ideal spouse. But the scholar does not uh, give up the hope of again consummating their love in distant future. And after their farewell, Kim again falls seriously ill, longing for Yong Yong. And worsening the situation, her aunt's uh, suddenly death, suddenly died, and which actually suffers his conduct with her. So with difficulty, the Kim brings himself to study again, and three years becomes a top like, candidate in the second examination. So he joins a parade for successful candidates given by the court, and passing by the princess, like Kwesan's palace, this reminds him of the Yong Yong. So he purposely falls from the force to see if any servants of the palace come to see him. And actually, princess. Prince's wife uh, as it her, hears the, of the accident and orders his servants, uh, her servants to attend him and lie on a bed in a chamber until he feels a fortunate to glimpse the young young behind the screen. And, but upon seeing her, his passion returns him to the, his sick bed. And when Kim was almost looks dead, uh, his peer, uh, the Yi Zhongja, asked the prince's wife to let him Kim to see the young young again. So Prince Wife takes a pity on him and sends Yong Yong to Kim. At that moment, uh, now Kim recovers his health and he and Yong Yong live together. So it's more like a happy ending story. And I like to introduce another story uh, which takes a very similar kind of format and the theme, uh, but quite different elements in there. That's uh, called the tale of Unyong, Unyong Jun. Uh, both story is, I think, actually depicts like the hero's rejection of social norms, but the male protagonist's disempowerment looks like it dominated these two stories. And uh, the actually, this tale is, begins uh, around the spring of 1601, and uh, Yu Yong is actually the narrator of the story. is kind of a scholar in a shabby clothes and lawyers around the palace Su Song, uh, which used to be the Prince Anpyeong's the residential palace. Uh, so actually the story, the setting in the real history is about this Anpyeong Daegun's like uh, the palace. Uh, maybe this like, palace woman or Unyong or the Kim Jin-sa probably fictional, but there's kind of a more like a real element and a little fantastical elements as well going on, on uh, out this play, uh, this story. And um, when you try to just find out where the Susan Gong is, you can actually just check out this like a Shilo and Tanjung Shilo. And there's kind of a little note that, oh, this, uh, the, the Su Gong was actually just called here by the Bun Zhong. And uh, again, I want to actually situate the story in the real kind of spatial like a notion. Uh, so when you look at this kind of map of Seoul, when you can Google it, right? And you can actually see this kind of Han River over here. And we see have the, the Gangnam here. And uh, this main town is kind of a center around this kind of northern part of the Seoul here. And uh, where is now Susongong? It's around this Inong Mountain over here. And it's very close to the Gyeongbokgung as well. 
So in case you happen to just uh, like uh, travel around this area, you can actually see uh, the site of Susongbong uh, at the foot of the you know, mountain. And this is more like old map. And you can see this Gyeongbuk Palace over here. And also the Changdeok Palace, Changdeokbong, and uh, Mountain Inangsan, Inang. And there's more many palaces as well, but you can see the Sajik, the altars for the god for the land and crops. And we see Namdaemun, the south gate over here. And we have also Chungmyeol, the world ancestor shrines. And here we go. This is uh, where the Suzonggong used to be located. And uh, we can imagine that what, what it looks like, uh, but uh, we only have this kind of, uh, but it's kind of a good uh, painting, uh, this trail landscape painting by the Chong Song. He is an Inang Tesekto. So when you look to compare this, uh, the painting to the photo we take now, uh, we see kind of uh, this more like a really similarity there. It's not coming from one's imagination or so, it's totally constructed upon what it observe with our own eyes. So, uh, you can actually imagine Susong Palace, uh, Songgong is somewhere around this uh, area. So back to story. So there he actually, the Yu Yang, the narrator, actually encounters two ghosts uh, in this kind of uh, desolate the area, the ruined area after the Japanese invasions. And uh, the actual two ghosts were the scholar Kim and Un Yang, who actually lived in the palace 200 years earlier. And so Yu Yong actually became curious about their story. So he was not kind of alarmed by, oh, it's, this is a really spooky ghost. He wanted to actually ask questions. So he begins to uh, wonder about the source of the sorrow in their faces. And the ghost of Un Yong to recount her past. So actually Un Yong is the main narrator of the story because uh, after just meeting with Yu Yong and the Jin Jin Sai and Un Yong, and based on Un Yang's voice, then now we just more uh, delve more into inner frame of the story. So uh, actually Un Yang recount her past and re um, introduce herself as palace woman from the palace of this uh, Prince An Pyeong. And uh, here is the quote. So uh, this quote from the Yu Yang. And when the Yu Yang asked them the, who they are, actually the Kim, uh, supposed to answer the question, but he kind of hesitated to reveal his identity. And he just kind of is saying this, uh, right? Uh, there's a, a reason why I cannot reveal my name to you, and though you insist on knowing it. So he kind of continues to ask for his name, but Kim replies like this. Oh, my family name is Kim. I was uh, 10 years old. I was good at poetry and writing. So my name was widely known. And I had a past second examination. And since then, people have referred, referred me as Kim Jinsa. And despite my youth and bright mind, I could not restrain myself and happen to meet this woman. And because of that, my body and bequeathed by my parents became unfilial. And what good would it be to know a senior names? So here, the Kim actually describes himself as a poet and scholar without revealing his personal name. And this passage shows his feeling of guilt regarding his romantic venture uh, with Un Yang. And he even identifies himself as a singer who does not actually deserve a name even after 200 years. So Kim also perceives himself as a failure child and looks like his guilt derives from this idea that he failed to perform the feel of love preserve the patrilineal line or honor his parents. So he renounced his moral obligation to Confucian scholar and instead succumbed to the temptation of love. So he subsumes his individuality into kind of collective sense of identity as a you know, member of his family here. But interestingly, the obscurity of the male's character identity is uh, juxtaposed with the prominence of female characters who are addressed by their given names throughout the text. So there's a two tan, the palace woman, each of this palace woman have their name, including Un Yong. In addition to the female protects Un Yong. Oh uh, yeah, Un Yong is willingly also, uh, she is actually the voice to this inner frame of the story. And she actually willingly express herself and narrate her own history to other characters. 
and she had to discuss this, her hometown, family backgrounds, and rosy memories from her childhood uh, in her letter to Kim, in her, the, her fir first voice like this. So I am from the Southern province. I was most favored daughter among my siblings uh, and blah, blah, blah. My prince wife actually trained me as her own daughter and prince was adore me. I understand more righteous and learned the styles and rhyme of Leary Chinese palace woman that admire me. It's like this, uh, unlike Kim, the Unyong's actually family name is uh, unknown, but her personal name, like I mentioned, like frequently throughout the text, tends to emphasize her individual and distinct uh, personhood. And conversely, the pattern of naming the male versus female characters in the story uh, distinguish itself from the practice of that time. In the record and the writing of pre martyr Korea, the male names were preserved while many women were nameless. And uh, usually men are allowed to have more than one name uh, including a pen name or a courtesy name like a cha or ho. But in Korean records or epitaphs of the young woman, women are rarely referred to her, uh, referred to by her personal name. And though the woman <clears throat> possess the personal names used in childhood, those names do not appear in official writing. Uh, uh, instead, a woman is more kind of identified by the relationship to her husband or of the, her family. And uh, we'll come back to this point late uh, when I discuss the politics of the well, female body uh, is kind of more like close to the conclusion of the, this talk. So uh, keep that in mind. And to return to the story, actually Charan is another palace woman very close to Unyong, uh, comes to wonder about the Unyong because something's going on with Unyong. So Chana asks Unyong what had what going on and we know actually recollect the following story about herself, and she actually found falling in love with a scholar Kim. So scholar Kim was uh, once invited by the prince Ang Pyeong and accompanied him at the gatherings. And when you know, when the Unyo is uh, happened to attend the scholar uh, scholar Kim uh, when he was uh, writing a poem, uh, a drop of ink actually fell on her finger. Now what that was the moment. So afterwards. The Unyo is long for him and became lovesick, and the scholar also fell ill. And a uh, coincidence, as you noted by this prince. And scholar had no access to palace without the prince's approval. And so he sought help in delivering a letter to the Unyo from the shaman who often like entered the palace to perform rites or so. So letter actually reveals Kim's deteriorating condition like this. So despite the immediate like attraction, the prescription of uh, woman's fidelity uh, made impossibly any courtship. So Unyang's status as palace woman demanded her devotion and obedience to the prince like all the palace women. So the, woman, the Unyang had taken a vow of chastity and more important that her relationship to, to prince created more complexity uh, in her. And Prince is authoritative or a patriarchal figure, uh, but he's also pro provides for and control and her education and physical condition too. So actually the story does not actually di directly indicate uh, any sexual liaison between her and the Prince, but other palace women teasing the, of the Wunya uh, about the Prince's yearning for her, uh, her and so in, in a physical relationship. So at this point, the actual story returns to the dialogue between Charan and Unyang. And Charan actually takes a pity on Unyang and suggests that she might have an opportunity to meet him if uh, the palace woman spent a summer at the Sogyeokseo, the palace closer, the palace closer to the city gate. And Charan actually summons a woman of the Western and Southern palaces and uh, all this palace women eventually learned that Unyong is seriously ill and they all should try to help them to meet each other. And but they're kind of torn between their duty to their master and sympathy toward Unyong. Uh, but with their assistance, Unyong and the scholar Kim finally met. And they, uh, they also plan to flee together uh, from the palace and ask uh, the Kim's male servants took uh, who is really excels at tricks and schemes to help them escape. But however, 
the prince again asked the palace woman to each compose a poem, and after reading Wu Yong's poem, suspects her uh, even more. Eventually, the court attendants informed the prince of the story of Wu Yong and scholar Kim, and so the prince actually summons the woman from the Western Palace and inter interrogates all of them. And after reading the palace woman's petitions, the prince assuaged her his anger by releasing the palace woman to their quarters, except for the union, who is placed in the separate room. And after seeing her like a fellow palace woman punished on her behalf, actually union hangs herself. So upon her death, scholar nurse of uh, learns of his male servants' wickedness, and including lie that took. Uh, would conduct uh, the Buddhist service to for Union with scholars money, but actually so, uh, to uh, uh, try to kind of seduce Union or try to uh, like steal Union or go with her. Uh, eventually he just found dead and uh, falling into a pit. And after this two deaths, actually scholar uh, retreats to the remote place and eventually he dies. So these are two uh, very similar kind of type of stories, but what looks like the Sangsa Donggi is uh, ending with more like happy ending uh, scene. But when you look at this kind of Unyang uh, John, we see kind of more a tragic tone uh, in the story. But here, I kind of want to just uh, think further about what do we mean by Sangsa Pyeong and what, how this kind of a medical or any document to describe about this uh, sickness. So actually, the literally the Sangsa Pyeong uh, is actually illness caused by the intense longing. So when you look at this kind of a character, Sangsa, uh, and many like the modern contemporary like, Korean people imagine Sangsa Pyeong is unrequited love, Sangsa Ujak Sarang, and so on. But actually, uh, you see in this kind of Sangsa Donggi and Unyongja, we see kind of more mutual commitments or mutual like exchange of feelings and love and passions we see in the text. So that Sang means like a reciprocal uh, and it's going back and forth. And Sa means uh, it's more kind of tricky. It's sometimes translated as to think or sometimes kind of longing. So to think is more like a logical thing, right? But the longing for is more close to the feeling, emotion. So this actually graphs ha can be kind of uh, denotes sometimes thought, meditation, speculation, or rational reflection, but also as part of the seven emotions. So it could be kind of characterized as, uh, as more one of our very uh, emotional elements too. Actually, sorry for my cats, <laughs> it's over there. Uh, it's a literal translation of Sang Sapyong, therefore means like uh, sickness caused by intense longing taking place in reciprocal relationship, especially between men and women. Uh, it's, we can uh, compare this with uh, our idea of one-sided love. And the Cho, like uh, chosen tales is, are likely to depict both male and female protagonists uh, became the victims of love sickness. Do you, so uh, it's not something from the unrequited love. Uh, they're in love with each other, they confirm their love, but something with the social obstacles or normative obstacles, they can actually meet or they cannot actually consummate their love. So the social barrier is kind of major enemy in this love story. And interestingly, in like Chinese Lear tradition, we see also uh, many description about the love sickness and experience of love sickness as similarly conceived of as a result of amorous passion, so overwhelmingly and destructive that possessed character with the ghostly illness. So uh, there, the, there is a main way to kind of uh, identify what Sang Sapyong is, but sometimes it's kind of a uh, a mental illness or a ghostly illness, or it's kind of coming from the speculation, too much of speculation, or is it coming from uh, this kind of too much of longing, uh, the emotion. And, uh, and also try to look in this kind of uh, medical treatise in Korea. So according to uh, this Ulbang uh, they there's some description about the Sang Sapyong and there's kind of main, uh, this idea is over here. Too much worry or thinking can cause uh, the damage to the heart. When the heart is damaged, one feels easily tired and had a face turn red. 
and Botox feel numb and pain came well up in the heart. And one might feel also overburdened and have a fever. Uh, so it looks like this, all the symptoms, you probably experienced some part of your life. Uh, but anyhow, uh, this is coming from the old, too much worry and thinking. Uh, it's from the Dong Yi Bogam. And uh, so uh, according to this kind of treatise, uh, we can say that um, looks like uh, this love sickness can like uh, cause some uh, an impact, the shortage of energy and which actually influences the spleen. And uh, because of that, a person can experience worries and kind of result in fatigue, lethargy, and ability to concentrate and so on. And the ceaseless long and brooding is often believed to provoke the symptoms of such as vomiting of nosebleeds or disturbed hearts. And in the experience of intense feelings of longing and loss, uh, this idea too much worry and thinking caused damage to hearts. Um, uh, that actually note that surplus pensiveness can affect the flow of chi, the, the energy, and extreme like passiveness also causes vital energy, the chi, to increase uh, when it should decrease. So the resulting energy of worries uh, and uh, it also can actually, um, <clears throat> this vital energy is actually defined as vital substance constituting the human body. So it's really, really important. And the vital energy comes from the, usually the two main sources, one from the one, one's parents uh, at conception, and also coming from uh, the kidney, which kind of sends like innate, innate vital substance upward and where it combines with essence would drive from spleen. Uh, so I, I don't wanna go into too much details of this part, but I wanted to emphasize more about this kind of um, culture aspect of a chi. So the culture weight a male chi, the vital energy likely stems from the Taoist notion of males, man's longevity. And Taoist philosophy suggests uh, certain sexual practices and techniques to prolong longevity. And so the goal of this intercourse is to obtain the essential yin and yang energy of each uh, the partner. And although the vitalization of energy is a crucial part in maintaining male health, uh, male health and constructing manhood, and it doesn't actually aim to promote like a sexual intercourse. Instead, instead the excessive uh, like indulgence in sex is warned against because the release of semen result in discharge of this energy, vital energy, we could have threatened man's life. So, uh, so uh, going back to this love sickness, so love sickness can actually create some stagnation of the vital energy. And, uh, and therefore the construct of vital energy is at the same time is a really important male essence in, uh, in Taoist philosophy and Confucian tradition, then implying that men are not only vulnerable to love sickness, but inherently have daily constitution susceptible to emotional stress. So this is a more like a, a logical way to understand uh, how this medical discourses uh, uh, view this love sickness. So it's could have caused by excessive uh, thought or longing, and that actually caused a loss of balance and self-control and that actually makes this disharmony in the flow and balance of chi, the vital energy. So eventually, love things can be understood as a form of emotional problem. But I also actually find another very interesting uh, description from the Dong Yi Bogam is about the Xin Yang Biang. Uh, it's not directly about the Sang Sap Biang, but this kind of quote says that uh, there is a Xin Yang Biang is actually happening to usually isolate a woman. Uh, like a palace woman or nuns, and because of their forbidden desires. So the woman's erotic passion experience speak to her lack of subjectivity and, and her intellect. And actually uh, her, uh, her woman's sickness her, or woman's like a suffering or this kind of kind of thing is construed as kind of sexual problem. So uh, we can actually simply say that, oh, the male like love sickness is more like emotional or mental uh, and um, woman's sickness is described more sexual and so on. Uh, I'm not actually uh, trying to like create this binary idea about it, 
But uh, I think that there still is very interesting comparisons that we can see uh, in the discretion of the Shinya film too. And uh, I want to jump into uh, the, the main like points of this lecture. Uh, it's about this politics of the body. So how this Changsa Biang relates to uh, our understanding of the body and, and uh, there's some kind of a more con social and political like context to in understand that. So this story actually portrays the male characters not only as a victim of love, but also of lonely beings. In the tale of Wunyang, the narrator Yu Yong is like a wonder about the ruins and scholar Kim seems to uh, lack an emotional bond with anyone other than Wunyang. And scholar Kim finds attachment and sympathy only with Wunyang, whose poem explicitly tells her feelings and yearnings. And this isolated male protagonist also exhibit a lack of mobility and ability to consummate in his affection. And, but his kind of evil, the male servant Tip though, uh, has a very a good talent for profit making and finding resources necessary uh, to achieve his goals. And his active performance contrasts with the scholar's insight in decisiveness, especially regarding woman and sexuality. And Tuk actually doesn't hesitate to forcefully take a village woman or attempt to take Union for her himself. And he finds Kim's bemoaning and suffering unfathomable. He couldn't understand that. And Tuk and scholar Kim then show a contrasting image of masculine love found in the romance. Servant Tuk actually actively satisfied his desires with the woman, while the naive, gullible scholar believes the word of Tuk, who actually grown increasingly subtle, and even if scholar's affection for Unyang has grown. So, uh, however, in the end, this romantic male's vulnerability does receive some compensation in the story. The scholar's passivity becomes a means of empowerment when he turns his isolation, sensitivity, and depression to his advantage. So his suffering and illness draw recognition from Union and others who eventually just feel sympathy for him. So finding Kim in language Haggard and Union actually laments, uh, looks like longing, yearning in his heart toward me is kind of something serious and it's, it's difficult for him to hang in there by himself. So although he directly wrote a reply sent to me, there is a no messenger to entrust a letter with. So he was alone in the war and lamentation. So he, she kind of really feels sorry for him. And his outward displayed emotion in his letter to uh, Union is to demonstrate his sincerity so this portrayal of lovesick hero who decides to reject the male privilege complicates a simple understanding of ideal masculinity. And the display of vulnerability helps the hero convince the objects of his devotion to accept his love and rewriting idea of masculinity by transforming his weakness into mark of superiority. And that sets him apart from the other male characters and aids him in consummating his relationship with beloved. At the same time, the ambiguous symptoms of love sickness allow the characters to fake uh, being in love. The symptoms are varied without headache, fe fevers, or signs of uh, severe bodily damage. And what is visible to naked eye is kind of subtle. Uh, the sunken eyes or kind of dark rings. And, but so Texas raises the question of whether the symptoms are natural consequences of unconsummated love or pretended illness to arouse a beloved sympathy. And this uncertainty also serves as a strategy for the containing or controlling desire. In Tale of Unya, the male protagonist uh, pretends to love sick uh, to earn a sympathy or consent from the authorities and the scholar draws the princess attention to his uh, like gaunt countenance and restless look. And when asked about this cause, he explains that I, humble scholar, and deeply grateful for your gracious hospitality. And uh, that I can still need to reach my body so I cannot actually eat or drink. But here, um, the expression of a shigum jompe, the refusing all food and drink, has kind of ambiguous meaning. It also refers to kind of strategy, kind of staging hunger strikes 
in a form of political protest. So as a symptom of love sickness, Chikim Jinping opens up kind of fluidity, uh, the, the fluid meanings of body within the given context. And more importantly, the text uh, about an expression of significance preserving the male body. In the tale of Sang Sadong, for example, the Yang Yang uh, kind of anticipating separation for her love and writing her last letter, it calls for him to preserve his male body. So you are the manly man with a heart like iron. And uh, why do you support yourself with concern for a woman like me? So please uh, like a, a pass the examination and build a reputation for yourself and preserve your precious body is uh, end quote. And this kind of male characters also address uh, the significance of the body too. As in the male protagonist and tale of Unyang fails to manifest uh, the masculine composer and charisma and falls ill. And his male servant took intervenes and telling him that, well, the brave man should die worthy of such a name. How can you languish in a heartbreak and yearning for your beloved like a petty woman and seek to throw away your body as a precious and thousand gold pieces? So here the two compares Kim's surrender to a passion to a kind of feminized form of love and reminds him of value of the male body. So actually the value of male body is emphasized in many texts like Shigyeong uh, uh, or Book of Songs or the Hyogyeong. So uh, there is kind of a very popular idiom that uh, the body and the limbs, hair or skin are given to one uh, by one's parents. To them, no injury should come. So you have to put your body is kind of a performance or a practice uh, of a filial piety. Uh, so there's kind of much more values in the body of preservation and protection here. So the uh, males, uh, in case uh, he were, is allow him to kind of become prey of illness, it could be a commitment, uh, committing a Confucian sins. And uh, males should not engage in sexual activities or not like a directly just kind of a connected procreation, but because sex should be used only to continue the family line, uh, which the male character in self-inflicted illness, illness has refused to do so. And there's kind of many quotes that kind of describing uh, uh, using your body uh, to kind of feel a piety is acceptable in case you have to uh, like a slice of flesh from your thigh to make a soup for parents, sick parents and so on. Uh, that's allowable. But in this kind of story, uh, you were kind of sacrificing yourself for love, right? Uh, it's kind of um, violence of this kind of idea, normal ideas. So uh, the symptom of love sickness, uh, the character's uh, effort to redefine the passion of love so as to integrate both the erotic and romantic aspects. And although the most important events that change the course of male protagonist's lives uh, suggest that love sickness is confusion sin. And sickness can also mortgage their bodies. So which is strive to prove love and obtain the consent from the society for the pursuit of love. And this cultural appreciation uh, of male body leads to reconciliation uh, of the pursuit of uh, love with the, uh, the confusion values. And the masculine love uh, demands a paradigm shift in the concept of the male body from uh, more like uh, a passive side of suffering to more like a functional side for negotiation. So masculinity inscribed in the story defy the chosen depiction of ideal male, but they actually reveal more like ambivalence with this uh, in which the romantic love is assessed. So male protagonist sexual passion is not completely removed from the text but the male body serve as site of struggle, that of a romantic hero living in Confucian society. So the lovesick hero, helplessness and vulnerability uh, ultimately accommodate the Confucian ideal as a romantic hero and objectifies and mortgages uh, his body to allow the leniency for a man's desire and to reinterpret Confucian view of male body. Um, for uh, the other uh, another five minutes, I want to just briefly talk about 
uh, the, then what's about the politics of the uh, female love sickness or uh, female body. And going back to this kind of um, we see that actually uh, is, uh, took her own life. So we see kind of a, a more of a very tragic moment in, in the story. But this kind of um, suicide actually makes the readers wonder about, well, what, what would be the real cause uh, for her death? And reader actually kind of infer that maybe Unyang dies from her frustration when she realized there is no way to break uh, her bond with the prince. Uh, and also, maybe she feels sorry for the prince uh, who has been really patient with her, although uh, he set his mind on her. And also, she might assume that her suicide could serve to, to save Kim's life. Uh, and also, there's another uh, recent interpretation about this, suggesting that depression may be resulting from Unyang's isolation from the outside world uh, might let her to lead her to suicidal thoughts. But the further uh, interpret uh, the cause of Unyang's death uh, is kind of necessary to understand the confusion views of suicide. So in fact, the actual Unyang's suicide uh, interrupts the popular belief that women who die unmarried or childless return to earth as evil spirits or one be, and dying without any proper heirs could be uh, considered sacrilegious in cultures and culture. So burial performed with proper decorum and treatment of disease constitute a part important part of Confucianism. And because of having proper heirs in a place to die was kind of regarded as path to spiritual security. Therefore, Unyang's death is, as a spinster with no heir can be seen as problematic in terms of the ritual customs for death at the time. And her death could make her a returned soul of ghostly presence uh, and which actually was product of premature death, such as suicide or dishonorable accidents or source of disharmony in society. But in Joseph's narrative, story dealing with the female suicide can be categorized into a couple of patterns. The first type is female figures who die resisting the sexual assaults. Uh, and that in this category frequently consists of married woman or widow the killing themselves to resist rape. And second type is anxiety-ridden with death, resulting from the loneliness after separation or domestic problem. And third type, it comprises voluntary death that fulfill the character's own need, wherein the character chooses to die for the sake of a patriotic loyal loyalty or filial piety or fidelity and so on. But if we apply this kind of categories to the case of uh, the tale of Union, the cause of Union's death can be considered kind of ill-defined and lacking ideological cause. And, uh, but from the early Joseon era, uh, the woman, uh, Korean women are indoctrinated to believe that there's kind of feminine virtue to follow, uh, virtue to follow her husband to death. Additionally, it was considered commendable for a woman to die resisting sexual threats uh, during the foreign invasion and so on. And Joseon state also experienced uh, exercise its power to promulgate this kind of behavior and labeling the woman's suicide as epitome, uh, suicide for her husband is the epitome of wifely virtue that actually helped the practice to permeate society. And to promote this code of fe uh, female conduct there actually the state actually cam campaigned to collect a case of virtuous deeds. And they actually built the monumental arches of chastity Yoyamun to this kind of chaste dead woman. And as a result, the frequency of the female martyrdom increased in 18th and 19th centuries. And although the Jordan government did not officially support this practice for, but female chastity was considered important to the state and monarch and especially in the upper class households. So gradually the cult of female martyrdom spread to the lower level, levels of society as epitome of righteous womanhood motivated by the example of elite and government officials. So in this light, the Leary construction, Leary construction of Union's death as honorable and heroic contains the social and political meanings and Unyong Jan, 
In the love triangle among Kim, Eunyoung, and Prince Anpyeong, the prince symbolized in an authoritative patriarchal figure demanding Eunyoung's fidelity and celibacy. But under such circumstances, Eunyoung was deprived of agency or resources to pursue a romantic relationship with Kim, decided to kill herself. And simultaneously, the Eunyoung suicide appears to echo the woman's defiance against social uh, coercion that controls the free agency of the human being as she claims her autonomy in shaping her own destiny. But her, can, her death can be interpreted as a bodily protest against the social uh, restraints on male and female relationships or against confusion ideological control of love as fasting, self-injury, or feigning sickness and suicide. They're all associated with active resistance and subtle nuances of uh, so in my uh, present uh, interpretation, the tale of Eunyoung suggests alternative way of understanding female death as a virtuous, though the rhetorical devices that help to render the female character's death as good and honorable. And specifically, the story depicts the female sacrifice and death as functioning to promote and support the cult of female martyrdom, while proving the influence of culture obsession that to celebrate the female martyrdom as embodying Confucian morality. On the other hand, the popularity of such cult opens the possibility to reconsider the female character's death as a virtuous one. So the death of Wuyang does not represent a shame or dishonor. Rather, it allows the reader to associate her death with the commemoration culture of virtuous womanhood. And the portrayal of female suicide might imply that the female protagonist passively conforms to the social customs, but in the process of negotiating virtues, the unya is reconstructed as, as both passionate and virtuous and part by the cult of female martyrdom. So uh, thank you for listening. And I kind of uh, like to uh, hear um, more from you about, in case you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you so much, Janet. I, this was fascinating talk. Um, so I think, wow, well, well, in your presentation, uh, you covered so many interesting um, themes within this uh, love sickness, um, masculinity, femininity, uh, desire, feeling, uh, medical discourse, body, the politics of body, and so forth. Um, this. Uh, I think I will start off by asking uh, the first question. Um, I think at one point, I think you mentioned um, that, you know, this, uh, you don't want to like construct this binary perceptions. Um, but, you know, as you're explaining about uh, uh, gendered bodies, male and masculinity and femininity, I'm just wondering um, how this love sickness is gendered and I and in how it's gendered and how it reflects social and gender norms in literary space because in the, uh, I think in, in some of the discussions um, that you uh, introduced I think it definitely reflects the societal norms and societal and gender norms so could you kind of elaborate more on this uh, gendered perception or gendered uh, understanding of uh, love sickness, or is it even gender? I don't know. <laughs> yes, actually, when I try to kind of uh, like uh, grasp this idea after reading these tales and so on, I kind of try more kind of gender the reading of those motives or representation and so on. But uh, after reading it more and more and keep thinking about it, maybe um, uh, we maybe the the attempt to like try this kind of gendered reading itself is more like a problematic, it's more framed. So, uh, but when you look at the story, uh, well, it's sometimes it's, well, uh, we see the male advances and woman uh, is kind of uh, isolated in this uh, like a chamber and they uh, sometimes accept, sometimes not, refuses. Uh, and uh, this kind of complicated situation made them to suffer, 
But but anyhow, uh, when you look at the story, uh, there's a male portrayal, the portrayal of male love sickness, and also the portrayal of a female love sickness. And there's no uh, striking differences between these portrayals. Uh, so that means women also suffer from the love sickness in the story. And it's more like a mutual rather than just one-sided uh, love or the symptoms of one-sided love. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, it's kind of, uh, I think, uh, it's a really good question. Um, should we just uh, uh, think about uh, or take this kind of a gender as a very important element in our understanding of love singness or, or not, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but what I find interesting is differently in the medical discourse, there's this, you know, that I think, um, you know, you refer to how women are more sexual beings or maybe it refers to widows or you know those uh, single women who have not had the chance to uh, to uh, consummate, and I, I don't know. I mean, there's this you know idea that women are more sexual, and they're uh, they uh, sexual being that that's why they kind of fall into this love sickness. I think that's the kind of implications that I got. So is that mm -hmm. something? So how would you? Because if there's, I don't know whether it's you know it's because women were restricted more and regulated in terms of their sexual activities and that's why there was this kind of you know medical discourse that's constructed or whether it's really the you know um understanding of female body mm -hmm. so uh actually this uh, medical description of a tangsa bell is not like uh it's all round it's very uh we only can find a very smaller parts uh, from the text and actually, uh, after this uh, excessive thinking can cause some kind of damage to uh, this vital energy and so on. Uh, and they actually have this kind of small like example. And actually this example did describe what happens to man in case this man actually suffer from uh, the, too much longing or excessive thinking uh, after meeting a woman and she got frustrated by that. And so there's no example for a woman one or the kind of describes description about uh, the woman patients blah 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 blah, but uh, uh, but what I actually tell by this kind of a description of Shi Yopyeong is that uh, but the text actually does not deny this woman also contain or have the sexual drive or sexual desire, and they kind of prove that oh they they are also uh, very sexually driven right uh, so and because of that in case they are frustrated. Uh, it can cause their them some make them more kind of uh, the old experience all different difficult type of the kind of symptoms and issues. So I see uh, there is kind of um more like um, uh, there the description actually kind of portrayed a woman as oh it's easily kind of vulnerable to uh, this kind of uh, sexual problem, but at the same time it kind of proves that oh they're also have the desire. So I think it's more like uh, uh, this, uh, like, yeah, it's fulfilling two goals at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. I think I'll, uh, there are two similar questions. So I, I think I will um, group them into one. And one is, so it's a question from Bev uh, Rao. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that last name wrong, but a student from GW. So could the Korean love sickness be considered a reason for the filial piety suicide? I think I think um, the student is meaning fidelity, not filial piety here. But as in, um, if a man was killed at a war or for any reason, and his widowed wife was compelled to end her life for the sake of, I think fidelity is what uh, the student meant. Could her death be considered a result of the love of this love sickness, and then related to that, I think there's also another question from um, uh, Nana Kim. Do you feel that current historical dramas perpetuate the idea that female martyrdom is something to uh, is something to celebrate and follow? Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess well, a part of female martyrdom. 
Okay, so uh, because of the time constraint, I could ex elaborate more about this kind of how I or how we can actually understand or relate the love sickness as Confucian sin. But uh, actually, uh, what I found intriguing in this text is they keep talking about the importance of male body. You have to preserve your body. You have to promote your family reputation and so on. Why don't you actually just waste your time or waste your energy or waste your body? Uh, for uh, this, this pity woman like me. Uh, so uh, this kind of very, um, uh, this uh, expression is keep popping up in the text and just made me think that looks like uh, this emphasize uh, in the cultural importance of male body. And there's some kind of idea the male body should be preserved, not only just man's sake, it's for the family. And, and, and the society, society or more, there's a more kind of family, uh, family values there. So in case this man, actually the Kim Jin Sa, uh, in case we take that up, the symptoms just kind of came upon him or is Shi Kim Jong Pei, he kind of protests against this, uh, this, the cultural norms. He, could, he, can, he cannot actually uh, just pursue his desire. And in case we take this more like a letter, uh, more political protest, this could be kind of um, against this kind of, um, or the violation of the cultural or confusion like the norms. So uh, uh, that's my kind of uh, take on of this, uh, the story. And uh, a second question from the Nana Kim. Yeah, I think uh, it's really uh, tricky and also important question. Now, I'm not actually uh, doing this saying that, uh, well, we have to promote this uh, like a female martyrdom and so on, but I, I'm kind of saying that because they're kind of a cult, like a commemorating the female death uh, in this culture uh, because of that. So uh, Unyang actually just uh, took her life, right? Uh, but this, uh, the death is not something like uh, something like a, well, just death for nothing, right? Or just kind of being or empty death is, well, but because of this cult or let's call it culture and social ambience that it kind of a help or supports uh, the readership to understand or take on her kind of death as something more kind of commendable or commemorable. And uh, I didn't actually go the very details of the story, but when you look at the story, uh, there's a kind of a, uh, the description how this kind of Kim Jin Sa uh, made a proper kind of a barrier uh, for the Unyo. And after that, he actually do uh, the couple of times the give the rights or offers the rights for the Unyo. And others is Kung Yeo, the other palace woman, also uh, uh, attend this kind of ceremony and the funerals and so on. So uh, it's, there are much more emphasis on this kind of a death, what going on after Unyang's death. So I'm trying to understand that maybe Unyang's death could be resituated in this cult of more female martyrdom. In case we do that, we probably have a more different side of the, this death, how we interpret her death. So that was my point. I hope that answers your question. Her question. Okay, uh, we have a question from um, uh, Professor John An from Howard University. What other parallel, I think this is a broad question. Uh, what other parallel literatures from China, India, or Central Asia share common literary genres and or motifs beyond uh, mythopoetic constructions of common day unresolved experiences? Maybe if you could compare uh, romance genre or love sickness uh, from more in a um, from, from from a comparative perspective, and actually there was this question uh, also by uh, Semi Park uh, asking, could you tell me what the biggest difference is between Korea and love sickness story and Western one? So if you kind of you know uh, briefly talk about the um, differences of love sickness or this romance um, story genre in a more comparative. Yeah. I hope I can answer all these questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I actually just check out a couple of like uh, like monographs about the love sickness, especially uh, the English literature, the British literature. They have some uh, uh, like analysis about it, and and also uh, like basically you can. Uh, there's many interesting materials. Uh, they're talking about uh, how this love sickness developed in the medieval the culture. 
in when they have this kind of idea of courtly love. So you admire this woman lady in the night and uh, the night age well of love sickness. And uh, also there's kind of a, and, and actually they believe that this love sickness coming from your eyes. When you look at it, you are kind of uh, being infected by this, this sickness. And, and, but after on, when it comes to closer to the 19th century, there's a more kind of description of love sickness, more like uh, coming from the kind of woman's uterine, uh, like if you have a uterine disease, it's coming from the like history, uh, hysteria. So uh, there's kind of, uh, in case you're just looking to this kind of um, uh, the one civilization story, it's situated in this civilization, you can actually trace it back and see uh, there's all uh, very diverse ideas is collapse, like converging together in this motives. And so I'm not very much more familiar with the Chinese or Indian or other parts of area, but I believe that they also have this, uh, this depiction of love sick characters uh, is really popular. So we kind of assume that Oh, it's very universal, it's everywhere in all the same. But when you look at uh, actually look into the story, actually uh, we see there's a we see more like a localized idea, right? Is because uh, it's coming from all different like a notion or philosophical sources uh, in understanding what is sickness, what is love, what is the body, and how they can deal with it. So I think uh, this comparative approaches is really, really uh like uh, is really uh, important. And also I want to kind of um, try myself to uh, indulge in this topic too. Yeah. Thank you for uh, stimulus <laughs> questions. Yeah. Uh, another um, comparative question. So from Yun Sun Yang, uh, according to Maran Epstein, filial love is a much stronger and central emotion than heterosexual romantic love in pre-modern China. Do you think this may apply to pre-modern Korea too? Can an excessive feeling of filial love cause a bodily harm similar to lovesickness in cultural representations of pre-modern Korea? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. For example, uh, an reaction to one's parents' death, she added. Yeah, I think uh, there is a kind of a popular way of like reading this kind of a uh, love tales in the China and, and Korea, uh, because uh, there's kind of a highest value of uh, like uh, for, uh, because coming from the Confucian uh, ideology, like filial piety and the loyalty and the fidelity and so on. So uh, we can imagine like filial love is always in, uh, in a position to uh, this kind of uh, passionate love, right? You, know, you have to devote your parents at the same time you find your own lover. Uh, you want to uh, pursue this desire. And so I think, uh, yes, uh, I think the Joseon Korea, uh, they also have very similar pattern too. Uh, it's always kind of, uh, and in, when these two values is kind of competing over, uh, is, it looks like a feel of love uh, is really tricky one <laughs> to handle. Uh, and because of that, the maybe characters, uh, they are kind of fail to uh, pursue what they really want to pursue. Um, and um, excessive uh, feeling of filial love caused bodily harm, similar to love sickness in cultural representation of pre-modern Korea. Uh, yes, I think uh, there are many examples like uh, uh, also it's actually from uh, influenced by the Chinese tradition, of course, but uh, they actually depicting this uh, or the modelizing or the making that more like a paragon of the virtue in case you try to sacrifice yourself, you're doing your bodily harm to actually uh, uh, practice this filial piety. And uh, that is kind of a acceptable form. Thank you. Um, so there's a question from Marla Arbat. Um, are the love sickness heroes and heroines always in love with people of the opposite gender? Or are there any stories from this period that hint at love for people of the same gender? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's that's a great question too. Um, mm, yes, actually, um, 
I found it really intriguing in the Joseon case that, uh, well, this, the story is originally very Chinese and especially it's similar to Zhang or Tranchi. Um, well, we don't see many kind of uh, stories between men and men or, or between woman and woman. Uh, it's much more like a kind of a setting, this, the setting of the story is usually between the male, male character and female character. So it's much more like, a, well, I, I, I don't want to generalize it, but uh, I want to say that uh, there we see more like a heterosexual love of, uh, in, in the story. And also the love scene is actually developed in the dream or in the conflicts of this, this uh, the pursuit of love. So yeah, I think uh, maybe this idea has been changed in modern times or, uh, but yeah, I think, but yeah, I, I, well, I don't have the answer for this right now, but yeah, this is a really great question, yeah. Okay, uh, so the question, next question from Jane Kim, uh, two questions. First, first is love sick, uh, for love sickness, were there any Korean traditional medical discussions on these symptoms? I think you briefly talked about this. And the, the second question is what you think would be the reason for the continued production of literary texts on love sickness? Any political historical reasons for the production and circulation of this particular literary genre? Yeah, so actually, is a uh, yeah, this is a good. Uh, is, thank you for the quite the great questions, Jane. Um, yeah, so uh, there is not like a. Many many discussions about love sickness in the medical treatises, but uh, there are some descriptions, and and based on that, uh, we can just kind of have more kind of glimpse on this idea what they how they perceive or how they theorize this kind of mechanic or mechanism of love sickness there, uh, but it's not very concrete, well developed, and highly you well elaborated text. So we there's we can use a lot of imagination or high interpretation for that, but uh, there are. And um, so why they wanna keep uh, producing this kind of story and they keep depicting about the love sickness, I think that's a really, uh, yeah, it's a significant question. And I think, uh, uh, as I mentioned that this actually love story is not something that uh, somebody loves the other and they did not like accept this love and there's kind of conflict between, it's not about, they actually mutually love each other, they, communi they communicate well, they actually confirm their love, their kind of confirmation of love. And, but after that still, they can make it because of this kind of uh, cultural norm or social barriers or a class or uh, because a woman is palace woman or is not allowed to do that. So I think that the story is subversively kind of challenge this kind of uh, what we believe as cultural norm during the time. So because of the subversive like element to our theme is really, really uh, kind of attracting more and more readers uh, or writers that keep producing about, well, well, why we are not happy? <laughs> why can't I just love in case we love each other? Why can't I just make it happen, right? Uh, so I think that there's more like subversive like a uh, type of uh, this uh, what, uh, type of the ideas in uh, producing this kind of literary text. And and also uh, interestingly, uh, usually the the romance or love stories uh, are usually kind of, kind of they're kind of stereotypical idea. There is kind of woman's genre, but actually this genre is it's starting from or uh, originally written by the male literati, uh, and and also it's kind of intermixing like uh, interweaving between uh, the real problem in in, in reality. So why cannot, we cannot consummate love? But at the same time, there are many kind of fantastic elements like a reunion after being a ghost kind of thing. So I think, uh, yes, this kind of uh, combination of reality and like fantasy is kind of a driving or a flourishing this uh, genre uh, until the, the end of the chosen period. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Anna uh, McIntyre. Do you think the way male and female love sickness and deaths are depicted and portrayed changed at all based on whether it was a man or a woman who wrote this romance literature? 
I guess whether it's depending on like male or female author, does it change? Um, or the way they portray love sickness? Uh, so the question is, uh, well, whether, uh, depending on the authorship, the gender of the authorship, so maybe the story can be changed? So how, whether, I guess it, uh, she's asking whether it's, you know, they, uh, depending on the, depending, depending on author's gender, whether there are, you know, whether you see differences in their portrayal of love sickness. Oh, yeah. So uh, in case, um, well, I have to find more, but usually this kind of the text that we are kind of seeing today translated in modern Korean and then the English, uh, usually kind of written by the man, man. So in case we can find more kind of a female writing about this kind of um, this kind of love sickness or love, love stories, uh, we probably can have more kind of comparative view between what's, uh, can we have find a difference between these two? But um, but unfortunately, um, we don't see many kind of um, literary production from women uh, during this period, especially the fictional genres. I'm not talking about all writing in general, uh, especially fiction or the uh, because a woman have a very limited access to literary Chinese uh, but all, of course, the young woman they can just read and write a literary Chinese, but uh, but the, the actually their production, literary production, is much more vernacular, and we see much more materials in lyrical forms. And there is many kind of poems talking about this feelings, longing, like uh, so so intense, uh, and so. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it could be a good comparison in case we can do uh, more research about this kind of uh, very, uh, the, this, the fictional genre and the lyrical genres. Uh, and, but presumably the lyrical genre probably coming from or the written uh, composed by uh, the woman poets, but uh, it's not, sometimes not very clear. Mm. Okay, a question from Ivana uh, Kubik. Is there any mention of how family members or other people close to the lovesick person react to this condition? Is mental and especially bodily sickness expected in such situations or is it frowned upon and considered exaggerated? Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, so th about this, uh, how the, the story actually depicting the characters, right? And uh, not in reality, right? So usually the characters are uh, pretty much isolated. The male character looks like uh, he's from very noble, good family, but there's no family like uh, around in, in this portrayal of the male hero. And also the women are palace women or uh, uh, just maiden uh, is living in its like a inner you know, chamber. So, uh, but, but eventually when the, any people closer closer to the character found about oh looks like uh, this character is uh, suffering and or, or having being sick because of love, uh, they pro they want to actually help they have to have more sympathy towards the character and they want to actually help this one. Then uh, buying one's kind of like uh, the this kind of sympathy and after that this male character have more opportunity to actually consummate their love or uh, try to just solve, solve or just find a way to seek this uh, the solution for the problem. And, but uh, it's not always kind of guaranteed, but, but still this kind of feigning sickness or real sickness is always in helping this character to, yeah, um, make that happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I, I have maybe, if I may, I, I would like to ask one last question. So uh, among, you know, many uh, love sickness novels, I'm wondering, are there more happy ending stories or are there more sad ending stories? Because <laughs> so, it seems like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, protagonists either die or they, or they transform into a ghost and then like, or, or, uh, in, or even a snake, right? Love sick snake. And um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what's uh, what's more, you know, uh, dominant 
like what kind of have what kind of endings are more dominant uh, in in this lovesick literature? Yeah, yeah. The well, yeah. And then a position to like generalize all oh, this how this chosen literature is are, are like and so on, but. Uh, Looks like uh, there's more like a vernacular stories as an ending with like more happy ending. <laughs> uh, they're kind of all well rewarded and they're so the bad people are punished. And but in this particular kind of a genre coming from the 15th century until the 17th century in this era and written by this male literati, uh, I think uh, is quite uh, specifically uh, distant from the other uh, like popular stories or genres. So usually the vernacular genres or uh, uh, yeah, they're kind of trying to, there's always struggle and conflicts, but eventually uh, they're all the characters are, are having their own ways. Uh, but in this story, they emphasize more like uh, uh, this kind of reality and what is going on after reality. And uh, this kind of a, uh, like a uh, cross over this real and unreal and also the life and death. Uh, so uh, I think it's coming from this kind of a more like the identity of this authorship or the author groups. Mm. All right, thank you. I think, you know, this uh, love sickness uh, is really fascinating uh, genre uh, of especially you know chosen literature because like modern days oftentimes people assume that it's as you mentioned at the beginning it's one-sided love but actually in chosen literature you see it's mutual actually Tangsa itself is mutual and reciprocal and you know the uh, uh, literatures that you analyze today show really fascinating aspects of uh, well I think we're out of time thank you so much for this uh, fascinating talk and uh, answering all the questions. Uh, I know it's very late at night there in Korea. I think it's over midnight. Right? So thank you very much for staying until late. And also thanks so much to our audience for joining us early in the morning, those of you who are in the East Coast. Uh, we will have another pre-modern Korea lecture series uh, on March 1st. Our last speaker, Masa Tasekawa, will be talking about the um, the wars in the Chosun dynasty, in the late, well, Qing and uh, Chosun dynasty. All right, uh, well, thank you so much and uh, hope you have a good day or good night, <laughs> Janet, and uh, see you next time. Thank Bye. you.